Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to the first uh, virtual learning experience of the year. Um, well, not of the year, of the semester. We are going to give it a couple of minutes for other people to join and we can get started. Okay, so I, I think in the interest of time, we can get started. Um, again, welcome everyone. This is the first uh, virtual learning experience of the semester. This is part of the Plus DS program. And today we will be covering a, a very introductory session on the basic concepts of machine learning. Um, so feel free to ask any questions. We have these. Um, this sort of question and answer mechanism in Zoom that we can use. Uh, again, in, in, in interest of time, I will try to cover um, the questions as I go, but uh, we, will, we will see how things go because there's, there are too many people in, in the audience. But again, feel free to ask any questions. So first of all, what, what are we going to learn today? So today it is, again, an introductory session uh, about deep learning. So these are the very basic concepts of deep learning. So we are going to get a better understanding what is deep learning, uh, what is the intuition behind or the mechanism behind uh, deep learning models, uh, as well as the necessary steps um, to build a deep neural networks. So we are going to talk about things like learning, and overfitting, how to select models, how to validate models, how to evaluate performance of the models. But um, in the end is really how we can use these algorithms, with, which we call deep learning models or machine learning models as a way of automating tasks by learning from data to make predictions. And we are going to talk about what a machine is and what learning is and what making prediction means in the context of machine learning. Now, but before we do that, uh, let's go through a very simple motivating example that has become very popular in, in machine learning and deep learning. So what you see on screen are examples of images. These are examples of a very large data set that is called the ImageNet data set that contains over 1 million images. And the purpose of this data set is conceptually very simple. We have about 1 million images, such as the ones that you see on screen. And the goal is to put each of these images into one of 1,000 buckets according to their, their content. Examples of that, we want to put the first image in the top left in the might bucket, the next one in the container ship, and so on and so forth. So we have 1 million images that belong to 1,000 different classes. And this problem of putting images in buckets is what we call 
a classification problem. We, are, we want to classify images according to 1,000 different uh, classes. Now the game is, can we build a model that takes an image and makes a prediction of how likely it is that an image belongs to a bug? Well, it turns out that back in 2012, this was a very difficult task. Um, and there was a version of a deep learning model that managed to do very well in this prediction task. And the examples now that you see on, on, on this slide show the images that are used for the model. The name below the image is the ground truth class of the image. And the little bars with gray names below it are predictions from the model. So for example, for the mic image that you see there, the model is predicted with the highest probability that the image is consistent with a mic. Just like the same happens with the next one, container ship, uh, motor scooter, leopard. But then the bottom row corresponds to mistakes the model is making. And what you can say is that although there are mistakes, meaning in the bottom left, figure uh, or image of a car, the ground truth label is actually grill, but the model is predicting that image as being a convertible. So you can see that technically the model is not wrong, it's just that the image is labeled differently. And this thing happens with the next image where the ground truth label is a mushroom and the model predicts it as an agaric, which is uh, a different variant of a mushroom, if you will. And the same goes with cherry and Dalmatian and Madagascar cat and a squirrel monkey. So you can see that even when the model made mistakes, it's making reasonable mistakes. Now, is such the impact of models like this that started back in 2010, that over the years, uh, it's been demonstrated that models get better and better over time. So the figure that you see on slide is the error made by these models as a function of time. And then you can see that in 2010, the model had an error between 25 and 30%. What we mean by error is that the model allocated the wrong class to an image about 27% of the time. But then you can see that by 2017, that error is actually smaller, lower than 5%. Now, what is more interesting is that if we estimate the human error by asking humans to label these images, we can see that by 2015, these models are already better than humans. The error rate in the ImageNet task is about 5%. So at least on image classification problems, uh, it's been demonstrated that these models are actually better than humans, which holds great potential for these models for being used in automated tasks where you want to look at uh, where, where you want to look at images repetitively and make predictions about that. And you can see that these models can be used beyond just classifying images. But this is just a motivated example. Now, before we go into what deep learning models are, let's start with something relatively simple. Let, let's, start, let's start with not deep learning, but shallow learning. And a very good example of shallow learning uh, is a logistic regression model, which um, hopefully is familiar to some of you. So let's start with that basic model. Now, before that, let's just state the problem, what we are trying to do. So we are trying to make predictions, right? So imagine that we have a collection of measurements and we are going to call that X and we are going to call those features about an image, for example, or features about an individual. And that collection of features, which is a vector of different features, we are going to call X. And for each one of those, we have a label. And for simplicity, let's just assume that the label is binary, zero or one, yes versus no, case versus control, you name it, right? And the game is very simple. The idea is given the features, meaning given X, we want to guess what the value of Y is. And more so, we want to be able to calculate the probability 
that y is equal to a specific value, let's say one, given the data or given the features. So now that is the process that we call prediction. So now, how do we do that? The idea is that we are going to collect data for which we know both the features X and the labels. And we are going to call that a training data set, right? And we are going to have N examples of those and N is the sample size. And the idea is by example, I am going to build a model that looks at these N examples for which I have both the data X and the labels Y, and I am going to teach that model. So the model is going to learn how to make predictions on its own. So later, when I have new data, which we call test data, and we call it test data because we only have the features X, we don't have the labels, we want to make predictions. So the process is relatively simple. The model is going to learn by example. Initially, we have covariates or features X and labels. And we are going to use those to teach the model to make predictions. So later on in the future, we can make predictions without actually having access to the labels. So that's why we call it a prediction problem because we are predicting labels from measurements X. So now let's look at a very simple formulation for such a model. And again, this is what we call a logistic regression model. So the circles that you see in the bottom, we can call them different features, different characteristics of an individual, for example, uh, age, uh, sex, um, race. We can also have things like heart rate and, and other characteristics, weight of the individual. And we are going to have different features of an individual. And what we are going to do is aggregate them using a weighted average. And a weighted average is really, we are just going to add all the values together, but to each of the features, we are going to multiply by a weight, B1, B2, Bn, and so on and so forth. So different features are going to have different impacts in this summary. So perhaps in some prediction tasks, age is more important than sex, or weight is more important than general health, and so on and so forth, or different uh, comorbidities. Is the patient diabetic? diabetic? Um, and then we are going to create this aggregate, which we are calling Z, and that number, which is a number between a very large negative number and a large positive number, we are going to convert into a probability. And for that, we are going to use the function that you see on top of the screen, which is called sigma. And we call that function an activation function. And but we also call it this particular function, we call it the logistic function. And that's why we call it logistic regression. So regression refers to the effect of averaging together features in a weighted average manner. And logistic is because we use the logistic function to convert that summary into a probability, right? So you can see that the logistic regression model has two components. In blue, it's a linear model that averages features. And in red, takes the average of those features and converts it into a probability. So we can interpret it as the likelihood that those covariates X are consistent with a particular label. In this case, label being one or yes or case or however we, we define it in practice. And we, we will have um, a few more examples of this later on. So now then what is the game? So we are going to have this model, this logistic regression model. We have the features X, we have the labels Y, so you can see that in this model, the only thing that we don't have are the weights of each one of the features, B1, B2, Bn. So learning the model amounts to essentially taking a training set for which we have the features X, the labels Y, to learn the parameter of the model, to estimate the parameters of the model. And again, the parameters of the model are the weights of each one of the features in the data, B0, B1 through Bn. 
right? So learning amounts, at least in machine learning, learning amounts to estimate the parameters of a model using a training set for which we have both the features or the covariates or the predictors and the labels. So those terms, features, covariates and predictors are used interchangeably in this context. So we are going to use those and the labels to estimate the parameters of the model. And once you've done, we've done that, we call that the model has been trained or the model has learned. And subsequently during the, the session, we will learn a little bit more about how this is actually done in practice. So now in a more geometric interpretation of what we are doing, you can think of having only two features, X1 and X2 as the axis of this figure. Each of the stars that you see there are individual samples of my training set. We have samples of two classes, class green, class red, and we are going to try and a, a, uh, we are going to try to build a model that separate green stars from red stars. Now, as you can see, geometrically speaking, what we are trying to find is a line, which we call decision boundary, the orange line that is going to separate as best as possible green stars from red stars. And what we can show is that that line is actually a function of the coefficients of the model, the parameters of the model or the weights, B1, B2, and B0 that you see there. And the likelihood, the probability of a label equal one, let's say the probability that the star is of color green is actually proportional to how far a star is from that orange line. So if it's too far away, the probability is very high because it's in green space. If it's too far away in the other direction, below the orange line, the probability is very low because now it is very unlikely that that star is from the green class because now it's in red space. So this is a geometric interpretation of logistic regression. And that function that you see there that looks like an S is the logistic function. And that's why in a way it's called the logistic function. So now, Having the logistic regression model, which is a weighted average with a logistic function and activation function, how can we generalize it to do something more sophisticated? So how do we go from this shallow learning to deep learning? So this is a generalization of logistic regression really, but let's start with a motivation first. So let's look at the example on the right. And what you are going to see is two groups of data. A group that is red dots is one class, class red, and the other class is class blue. So we have, again, two classes, one and zero, red and blue. And the game is really, can we find a function or a logistic regression model that separates red from blue? And what you can see, because this example is in two dimensions, is that it's actually very difficult because it is going to be very difficult to separate the red cloud from the blue cloud using a line because it's a more complicated data. So we need to be able to do something more sophisticated than a linear model or logistic regression model. And in fact, you can see that if we were able to draw an arbitrary curve, which we call it a nonlinear function, or a nonlinear boundary, we can actually do a pretty good job at separating the red dots from the blue dots. So in this example, you can see that in some cases, there's an actual need for a model that is more sophisticated than a linear model that creates separations between groups of data, let's say blue and red, that are more complicated than simple lines, which is, the way that it has to happen if we use a logistic regression model, which is a linear model, and is linear again because separates in linear trends. So now let's let's go back to the uh, logistic regression model. So this is the example that I showed you before. 
The circles in the bottom are the features. We have n features. We are going to calculate a weighted average using weights B1 through Bm. And then I am going to take that weighted average, which I am calling Z, and I am creating a probability using a logistic regression model, and sorry, a logistic function, which is denoted by sigma in that um, slide on, on the top. But now, what if we could actually have the same data and create multiple copies of different logistic regression modules. In this example that you see here, we actually have K versions of that. And now we have sigma of Z1 through sigma of ZK. So really all we've done is instead of only using one logistic regression model on one data set X, we have used K different logistic regression models on the same day, right? So there's nothing really stopping us from doing that. Now, what is the problem? In a logistic regression model, the features X are connected to the label that we are trying to predict Y using the logistic regression, meaning the inputs to the model are X and the outputs of the model are the probability of Y. But if we have K different logistic regression models, then what is the output? Is it the first one or the last one or some combination? The problem is that we don't know. So because we don't know, we can actually take a little bit of a lazy uh, solution and is, well, if we have K outputs from K logistic regression models, we can use those K outputs with another logistic regression model as a way to connect to the output. So really what we are doing is we are taking those K processes, K logistic regression models, we are going to use them as an input to another logistic regression model, and then the output is going to be consistent with my label. So note that now we have created a two layer process. The first layer, is K logistic regression models. And the second layer is one logistic regression model that aggregates the outputs from the K logistic regression models down below. So now you can see that we have a two layer model. So now you can see that we are building into some model that eventually is going to become deep as in having many layers. Um, so now, just to settle this and more conceptually, let's look at an example. And let's look at an example with images. So what you have on screen are examples of images of handwritten digits. So really someone is writing digits, numbers between zero to nine on paper. Then someone takes a picture with a camera and cuts the digits. So we have many examples of zeros, ones, twos, and so on and so forth. Right? And this data set is very famous in machine learning and it's pretty large. So we have about 60,000 of such images, uh, roughly equally divided between different types of digits. So you can see that now we have images like in ImageNet and we have 10 different labels. Now, what are the labels? The labels are the identities of each digit. Is the image of a zero of a one or a two or a three? or a four and so on and so forth. So now, because right now we are concentrating on binary problems, let's just do something simple. Let's just take, take the zeros and the ones out of the MNIS data set. So on the left, you see some examples of that. On the right, you see examples of ones. Um, so someone is asking, how are those sub-logistic regressions decided, normally you take the maximum likelihood. Is, is it that you are looking at different features for the different models or just fitting many different curves? Well, we actually don't have to decide. And that's why we are taking K logistic regression models and we put another one on top. So we don't have to make the decisions. So really what the model is trying to learn is different patterns with different logistic regression models. And then the decision as such is being made by the top 
logistic regression model. So instead of being a combination of features, we, like in logistic regression, this is logistic regression, the output of a model is a combination or, a, or an average of features. In this model, we have a combination of a combination of features. And each combination is a logistic regression model. So that way we build complexity and we can build as much complexity as we want. And we don't have to worry about the outputs of the individual models because that's why we have a logistic regression model on top that is going to combine all the outputs together. So we don't have to make those decisions. Okay, so let's go back to this example. So we have zeros on the left, ones on the right. So conceptually, the problem is very simple. We are going to take a collection of zeros and ones because the model takes features and we have images. We are going to vectorize them, meaning we are going to take that, make, that image and we are going to unroll it so we get a list of features, right? And each of the features is the intensity of one pixel in the image. So zero if it's black, one if it's white, right? And then we are going to fit them through our logistic regression model. And then using some learning procedure, which we are going to talk about later, we are going to learn the parameters of the model and the parameters of the model are B1 through Bn. And remember, we have as many parameters as pixels in the image, which means that we can take those parameters and reshape them back into an image. So now conceptually, we can see that what the model is doing is comparing an image with the parameters of the model and then making a decision of whether the image is consistent with a digit one or a digit zero. So now let's look at how that actually happens in practice. So what you see on the left is an image of a zero. What you see in the middle is are the parameters of the model, right? And parameters of the model that are positive are in red and parameters of the model that are negative are in blue. And we are going to call these parameters a template or a filter, right? And why do we call it a template or a filter? Because what you can see is that the output of the model is going to be consistent with the agreement with, between the image on the left and the template or the filter on the right. And let's look at specific examples. What you can see is that if I overlay the zero on top of the filter, you are going to see a lot of blue. So a lot of negative numbers, which when we pass it through the logistic function, we are going to get a very small number. Remember that the logistic regression function maps negative numbers to numbers that are close to zero and positive numbers to numbers that are close to one. And that, that's why it looks like an S. So, because here we see a lot of blue, this looks like a zero. And you can see that it actually looks like a zero because it's a template. But then alternatively, if we, if we take an image of a one and we put it on top of the template, we see a lot of red. So those are positive numbers. So the probability that this is a one is very high. So now in contrast, you, you can see that if the image is consistent with the blue parts, the, mall, the, the prediction is very low for the likelihood that the image is of a one. And if it's red, it is very hard, large or close to one with the likelihood that the image is a one. So you can see that the parameters of these logistic regression models can be interpreted as templates. So what the model is really doing is checking for the consistency between the inputs and the template. And if the template is very consistent, then chances are that the input is consistent with that template. So it's consistent with a zero or consistent with a one in this case. So that is more of a visual interpretation of what a logistic regression model is. So now, not one thing. When we look at these parameters, you can see that the way that the model sees the number one and the number zero is very simplistic. There's only one template for the number one, and there's only one template 
for the number zero. However, if we look at the data here, what you realize is that there are many ways of writing the number zero, just like there are many ways of writing the number one. So if we take the four as an example, you can see that these are four different ways of writing the number four, and they are all correct because people write the numbers in different styles. So now if we only use a logistic regression model to detect the number four, you can see that we will, we will be comparing all the digits against, against a single template of a four, which is somewhat counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive in the sense that the model is going to try to compare everything with sort of the average way of writing a four. And that might be unfair with people that write the four in a very characteristic way. You can see the examples of the left, they don't look a lot like the template on the right, which means that there's some room for improvement. So now, what if we could just build a model where instead of just having one template, like in logistic regression, we could have many templates and the model compares the image with different templates and then aggregates the output of the model by aggregating the agreement of an image with a collection of templates. So now you can see that this starts looking like the model that we were talking about before, where you have many logistic regression models. Each one is one template. In this case, we have three logistic regression models. Each one is a template. In this case, we have K different templates, which are corresponding to K logistic regression models. Each one, the output of each logistic regression model is going to tell me how consistent is the image with a given template, for example, different ways of writing a four. And then the second logistic regression model is going to aggregate all of those agreements and is going to decide, is this really looking like a four or like a zero or any other digit, right? But you can see that really all we have is K plus one logistic regression models. K in the first layer and one in the second layer. So this becomes a two layer model the first layer has K logistic regression models, and the second layer has one logistic regression model. Now, and you might wonder, well, but should we just stop with two? Can we create um, aggregates of aggregates of aggregates? And, and the reality is that you can actually do it. We can take K logistic regressions on top, then you can add J logistic regressions in the next layer. And then we can create another logistic regression on, on top. So now you can see that this model has three layers with K units in the bottom, J units in the middle, and one unit in the top. And now this three dimensional model, three layer model is what we call a multi layer perception, which is one very specific type of a deep learning model. So now, what is a deep learning model? It's a multi-layer model that has many layers, so many that we call it deep, and it's learning because we are going to use a data set for which we have the features X and the labels Y, and we are going to use that data set, which we call the training set, as a means to learn the parameters of the model. And as we already see, uh, the parameters of the model can be interpreted as filters, as, as templates that compare the input to the model to different ways uh, in which the data is configured as a means and to make uh, accurate predictions. Now, this model has three layers, but you can see that we can specify as many layers as we want. And if you uh, go through some papers in the literature, what you are going to realize is for complex data sets, you build models that have 40, 50, 60 layers. And for those interested in, in more advanced uh, learning experiences, you are going to see that 
first hand. But for this particular example, we only have three layers. So another question, besides the logistic regression, what other shallow learnings could be used in deep learning? Well, that is a very good question, right? And the reality is that we are not restricted to logistic regression. The reason why we present it as logistic regression is because it's a very simple model that has very little components, but other linear models can also be used um, to build deep learning models. Now, remember that the reason why this linear model is called logistic regression is because that function on top, sigma, is the logistic function. But we can replace it by many other different functions that can serve different purposes. And the linear model um, in below can be replaced by other functions as well. So we are not necessarily restricted by logistic regression models. It's just one special case that is used in, in logistic and that, it, that is used in multi-layer perceptions. In fact, we can use other um, more sophisticated mechanisms like convolutional filters as a means to learn more complex relationships between the uh, inputs of the model. Now, uh, another question is, is there is a three-layer model seen as a more powerful than a two-layer model in making more accurate predictions? Well, the reality is that is not necessarily the case, and I will answer that question a couple of slides. So just hang tight in there, because that's a very good question. Not necessarily a deeper model is going to result in better predictions. So we will get that into a, in a minute. So now, um, the result of building these multi-layer models is that by building multi-layer models, we can actually create more sophisticated decision boundaries. So we can go from lines, like in a simple logistic regression model, to arbitrary curves that are going to be able to more flexibly fit the data so potentially they can produce better results. And I say potentially because that's not always the case. Now, another question is, are there are different layers associated with different types of features? Well, in this model, that's not the case. As you can see, all the features, all the inputs to the model go through all the layers. But you can design models in which different subsets of inputs go to different layers. And that can be done in particular when you have structured data. Imagine that you have inputs, some of which are images, some of which are text, some of which are tabular data, and you can have different layers of the model processing different aspects of the data. So that is entirely possible. But in the most simple representation, all the inputs go through all the layers. But that's a very good question. So now the question is, how does it work with MLIST? Um, and I am going to give you the results. So if we take the entire MLIST data set, which is about 60,000 images, and we build one logistic regression model, the very simple model to classify all 10 digits, we can get 91% accuracy, right? And that means that the model can guess the digit by looking at the image 91% of the time. Now, if we build a two-layer model, so if we go from one logistic regression model to a two-layer model, we can get 96% accuracy, right? So we get a 5% accuracy gain just by adding one layer to the model. So the answer is that in this particular case, building a more sophisticated model actually improves our ability to classify digits from images. Now, I am not presenting in, in this slide, but you can see that adding more layers 
starts improving the results a little bit, but there is a point of diminishing returns at which adding more layers is not going to improve the performance of your model. So in some cases, more sophisticated, deeper models improve performance, but at some point, um, the capacity of your data is going to be fulfilled by that model and the performance characteristics are going to cap. Now, how do we actually learn these models? So we are going to give you a little bit of an intuition of how that happens, um, but we have other learning opportunities where we are going to go more in detail about how these models go to learn. So the intuition is actually very simple. We specify a model like the one on the left, three layers. We are going to take one example or a, or a small collection of examples, and we are going to fit them through the model, meaning we are going to present those data points X as input to the model, and we are going to see what the output is, right? And then what we are going to do is we are going to compare the output to the model to the ground truth. So let's say the ground truth is one, and the model says that the probability that is a one is 0.6. So we're going to look at that difference and we are going to change the parameters of the model. So the values of all of these templates, and we are going to change them in a way that that 0.6 gets closer to one. Meaning we are changing the parameters of the model in a way that the model gets better at, and better at guessing the right labels of my data. And we do this in an iterative procedure, meaning we feed the data, we call that a forward propagation, we compare it with the output, and then we propagate back by changing the parameters of the model in a way that all the predictions shift in the right direction, and then we'll repeat that until the model gets better. Now, this process of bug propagation is done using is done by calculating gradients over the network. Now, for now, you don't really need to understand what those gradients are. But locally, modern uh, Python or R packages calculate these gradients for us. So all we have to do is specify the model, specify the data set, and the Python package, for example, something like TensorFlow or PyTorch are going to calculate this gradient for us so we can update the parameters of the model. So the process of learning the model so it gets better at making prediction is being done semi-automatically by a Python package. So we don't have to worry too much about the way in which these gradients, so the tweaks to the parameters of the model are actually done in practice. So another question, um, does complex model always perform better, better than simpler models? Well, the answer is no, not necessarily. Uh, and I already touched a little bit on that, but what is more important perhaps, it's a very good question, but what is more important is how do we know? How do we know which one is better? If I have a simpler model, like a logistic regression and a more complicated model, a two layer model, how do we know that is better, right? And the answer is, well, we can just calculate the accuracy and we can see which one is the better, the best one. And that's really what happens in practice with some modifications that we are going to touch on in a couple of slides. But really what we do is, because we don't necessarily know if a more complicated model is better than a simpler model, what we have to do is to try both. We calculate the performance and then we say, well, if the more complex model has better performance, then it's better. If not, then we pick the simple model. So we actually have to try. There is not an easy way to tell whether a simple model is going to over outperform a more complex model given a data set because it's a very complicated topic. This is still an open problem really in, in the field. So now, how do we estimate performance? Because before we just, I, I just told you, oh, 
a, a logistic regression model gets 91% accuracy and a two layer model 96% accuracy. So the two layer model is more accurate than is better. Oh, but how do we do that? How do we do that in practice? And the reason why we are interested in performance is because we are trying to answer precisely that question. Is logistic regression model on the left better than the deep multi-layer model on the right? We need a measure of performance. And before we, we answer that question, what we need to address first is the problem of overfitting. The problem is that sometimes when you have a model that is too sophisticated, the model can start memorizing the data. And memorizing the data yields to something that we call overfitting. So let me just illustrate what overfitting means with a very simple example. Imagine that we have data in one dimension X, and what we are trying to predict is the number in the Y axis. So we are trying really to find the relationship between f of x in the y axis in the x axis, which is called x. Now, there are many ways of feeding a function through all of those blue points. And let me give you three examples. On the left, we have a linear function that essentially assumes that the relationship between x and f of x is linear, is a line. And we call that a first order fit. The one in the middle assumes that is a, a third order fit. So it's a more complicated function. And you can see that now it's a nonlinear function. It's no longer a line, it has curves in it. But then you can also see that if we feed a model that, that has an eight order polynomial, that function red in red actually crosses all the dots in the plot. Now the problem is that if you think about it for a minute, the, the feet on the right almost looks too ridiculous, right? And it's ridiculous in the sense that it's too complicated. It is very unlikely that the process that generated those blue dots is so complicated that has that many curves, which means that the truth should be somewhere in between, right? Now, what that means is that the, the fit on the right is, is what we call overfitting. So the model is overtrained so much so that the model has memorized the data. It's memorized in the sense that the function crosses every blue dot. And that can't be possibly good because that means that the model is so set on memorizing how the data looks like that is not going to generalize well. So this process in which the model is too complicated for the data that is being used is called overfitting. So now, how can we prevent overfitting or how can we tell if the model is overfitting? Well, it's actually very simple. Instead of looking at how the model behaves on the same data that it was trained, um, we need a separate data set that is completely external to the data that was used to feed the model, right? So the process actually looks like practice. We take a data set, we train the model, so we estimate its parameters, and then we take that model and we test its performance on the real world on a completely different data set. And we call that a test set. And then we calculate the performance. How we can calculate the accuracy. How, what proportion of times the model makes the correct predictions, right? So it looks like this in this slide. So the training set is in blue. We build the model parameters B1 through Bn. Then we take a new completely separate data set and then we use it to make predictions with the model, and then we evaluate the performance of the model. And then if the model is good, then the model should have good performance on this new test data. And if I have different models, let's say a logistic regression model and a two-layer network, 
I do the same. I build both models. Then I take the new data set. I make predictions with the logistic regression model. I make predictions with the two layer model. I calculate the accuracy. And then I select the model that has the best performance. So the process of selecting the model amounts to use an external or a separate data set as some means to decide which model is the best. And this also includes the possibility that in some cases, the best performing model is not the more complicated model. Why? Because sometimes the more complicated model is overfitting. So it has memorized the data so much so that when applied to new separate data, the model is going to completely fail. So the model is not learning trends, patterns in the data, it's just memorizing the data that it was used for training purposes and the model is going to fail. So in some cases, again, a simpler model might result in better performance than uh, a more complicated model. Now, you might ask, well, but where do I get this real new world data from? Well, and in practice, sometimes it's difficult. So what we do is something more practical. What we do is we take the training data, which and you see an example of that on the left. And what we are going to do is we are going to randomly split it in three buckets. The first bucket is the training bucket, which we are going to use to estimate the parameters of the model. The second bucket, we call it a validation set, which we are going to use to play with the model. And the last uh, data set, which we are going to call a test set, we are going to use to estimate uh, the performance of the model. So that means that we have effectively have three data sets, a training set, a validation set, and a test set. So now, which one is for which? So the training data set is used to estimate the parameters of the model. The test set is only used at the end to evaluate the parameters of one single model, right? But the problem is that when we have multiple models, let's say we have a model with one layer, two layers, three layers, five layers, and each layer has a different number of logistic regression models, how do we know which one is the best? So what we can do is we train all of them in the training set, we evaluate the per their performance on the validation set, and then we pick the one that works the best. So on the validation set, let's say the best model is that with two layers. And then we use that model, that single model on the test set to estimate its performance on the real world. So that means that the test set is only used to estimate the performance of the model, is not being used to make decisions about which model is the best. The validation set, on the other hand, is the one that we use to select which is the best architecture for a given data set. One layer, two layer, three layers, and so on. So now, the whole process is actually somewhat cyclical. We build a model on the training set, we make predictions on the validation set, we refine it, let's say we add more layers, we build it again, we look on the validation set, and then we repeat this process by changing parameters of the model until we are satisfied. And when we have a model that cannot do any better on the validation set, then we evaluate its performance on the test set. So this cycle using training and validation is repeated multiple times until we are satisfied with the model, and then we use it finally to estimate the final performance or the performance characteristics of the model. And this is really what you typically see reported in publications. Now, something that we might want to do is in some cases, because these models are very big, in particular, the ones that have many layers, they take a long time to train. 
So when we are estimating the parameters, it can take hours. And because the model is likely to overfit because it's too complicated, sometimes the model can actually be learning well, and then essentially might start overfitting. So what we do is instead of just training the model until the model has converged, converge means that the parameters of the model do not change as we present it with more data, we can actually monitor the performance on the validation set as we do that. And what we are going to realize is that as we train the model, the average loss or the error that the model is making in blue, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. But if at the same time we evaluate the performance on the model on the validation set, what we are going to see is that initially it's going down, so the model is generalizing, the model is learning, the model is getting better at making predictions on separate data. What separate data the validation set? But at some point, the model is going to start overfitting. So the model is going to start memorizing the data. So the model gets better at better on the training set, the blue line keeps going down. But once the model starts memorizing, the model is going to start doing worse on the validation set. So you're going to see that the orange line is going to start increasing. So we call this early stopping. And what it means in practice is that as we train the model, we are going to plot or we are going to record the validation loss or the validation error. And we are going to stop the training of the model once the model starts memorizing, once the model starts overfitting. And that happens in the point at which the error of the validation set starts increasing. So we are cutting the training and that's why we call it early stopping. Uh, so let me answer some of the questions. Uh, so do you just calculate that manually by humanly checking? Uh, do you just calculate that manually by humans checking them? I am thinking about something like x-rays or a medical record where there are millions. No, you actually don't calculate it manually. When we learn the models, this is done automatically. So let me just go back a little bit. So we, when we train a model here, let's say we are working with electronic health records and we have millions of them. Let's say we feed 10 at the time through the model. So we feed 10 medical records. We see what the output of the model is. We compare it with the ground truth. Let's say we are trying to predict whether a patient has diabetes, something, for example. So then we compare the predictions with the model with the ground truth. Does the patient have diabetes? Yes and no. And then we take the difference and then we modify the parameters of the model. And then we keep doing that 10 electronic health records at a time. Now, when I say we, is a computer program. So you write a small Python script that fits the 10 records to the model and there's a function that calculates the gradient for you and updates the parameters of the model. And then you leave your model running for hours. And the model is going to feed data, update the, the model, feed data, update the model. And that's why I was talking about this learning curve. Because you keep feeding data to the model, the model keeps updating. So the model gets better and better and better. And eventually the model starts memorizing and that's where you stop the model. So you don't have to check that manually. You just feed the data to the model using a Python program and the model does the calculations for you. So you have to do it manually. Do you need larger training data sets if you want to add more layers to your model? Uh, as would be the case if you added more features to your model? That is a very good question, right? So now if you have a more complicated model, you have more parameters to take. So the bigger the model, well, the more data you are likely to need in principle. However, there are techniques that we call regularization 
which essentially control the complexity of the model. So you can actually have a big model on relatively small data sets, which means that now you have more parameters to set because in addition to specifying the model, you need to also specify the regularization parameters that control how complex is the model so you can control for situations where you don't have a lot of data. So in principle, yes, you need more data as your model grows more complicated. However, you can build complicated models on small data sets if you properly regularize your model. And regularizing amounts to control the complexity of the model to prevent uh, overfitting. Another question, do you check the accuracy using a confusion matrix or a more complex method? That is a very good question and it depends on the actual task. In the example that I was showing you before, I was just calculating accuracy, which is what proportion of the images the model calculate, estimates correctly, right? But then you can see that there are different ways of uh, measuring performance. You might be interested more on what proportion of ones the model accurately uh, predicts or what proportion of zeros, not just the combined accuracy. And in such cases, you might want to use a confusion matrix as a way to also calculate the proportion of ones the model gets right, the proportion of zeros the model gets right, but also the proportion of ones and zeros that the model gets wrong that we refer to as false positives and false negatives. So there are many performance metrics that can be evaluated and they depend on the application. So for example, we are now only talking about classification models, but if we are doing other tasks like regression or object detection, the metrics change uh, slightly. So the metric needs to be appropriate for the problem that is being solved. How do you know overfitting is happening? So a very good way of checking overfitting is by plotting the validation error or the validation performance as the model is trained. Because if there's a big gap between the performance of the model on the validation set and the performance of the model on the training set is because the model is overfitting. In theory, those numbers should be close to each other. Once the validation performance is worse than the training, the model is overfitting because there's a gap. The model is failing to generalize. So comparing the validation performance and the training performance is a good way of assessing overfitting. How do you know how big to make the train validation and test uh, sets? Well, there's actually not a rule of thumb for that. It actually depends on the size of your data sets. Um, but if you read papers, more, most, most people go with a partition where a, a larger pro proportion of your data is used to train the model and relatively equal amounts of data are, as are used for validation and test. So typical examples are 50% for training, 25 and 25 for validation, or 60, 20 and 20, or 70, 15 and 15. So there is really not a strict way of doing it, but is usually around that uh, guideline. A larger proportion for training and more or less equal amounts of data for validation and test. How do you make a decision about what end probability is acceptable at the end of your model. I assume you cannot have 100 accuracy ever. And there might be times when you actually want lower probability of accuracy. That is a very good question. So it's very difficult to find problems in practice where the accuracy of your model is going to be 100%. And an example of that is the, the use case that I showed you before with images. Even when you ask humans to label images, you are going to have 5% error. So even humans are going to make mistakes. So it is very 
unreasonable to think that your model is going to obtain 100% accuracy. Another example is that you, if you are looking, for example, at handwritten digits, in some cases, people are so bad at writing that not even a human can distinguish some digits. So you can look at some examples here and we can find people that could argue that some of them actually look like digits at all. So pretending that a model is going to be able to get it correctly all the time is unreasonable. So what we do is we try different architectures for the model and we select the one that performs the best. At some point, the model is going to cap in performance and then we can consider that that's the best we can do with the model and the data that we have in hand. Now, how do you know the data size is too small? Well, if, if, if there's an assumption that your model can actually learn, meaning that the data is informative of that that you are predicting, what you can do is you try different models starting from the simpler one. In, gen in general, if the basic model is not able to produce better than random results, meaning error rates uh, less than 50%, it, be it, it means that your data set is too small. So if even the simpler model is failing to learn, chances are your data set is too small. So it's a, it's a good uh, rule of thumb just starting with the basic model. So now, what, what we have talked about today are very simple models, multi-layer perceptions, but then we can build more sophisticated models for more sophisticated data, like images or text. And we are going to have subsequent uh, learning experiences that are going to tackle these models. And what you are going to realize, as someone was asking before, all we are going to do is change these little modules. We are going to change this logistic regression model by something that is more appropriate for images. And in fact, the module that is appropriate for images is called a convolutional operator. So models for images are typically called convolutional neural networks because they are made of convolutional operations. Now, the conclusions of the session today is that we can build very sophisticated models with simple building blocks, in our case, logistic regression models. Uh, in some cases, such complex models can outperform simple models and even can outperform humans. However, as a cautionary uh, tale, more complex models do not necessarily mean better performance models, which means that we need a proper validation strategy where we have training, validation, and test set. So we have a mechanism to select what is the best performing models among a collection of different architectures. So we don't have to deal with problems associated with overfitting, and we can select the model that better fits the data and not simply the more complex model. So now, on more sophisticated models, the next learning experience uh, that I invite you to attend is on convolutional neural networks. These are more sophisticated models for images. This is happening on, on September 21st, but then later, we are going to have another learning experience on how to participate in Kaggle competitions, which is this mechanism for people to participate as a team in building machine learning models to solve real world problems. They are usually connected with a prize. So that's, that's, that's very interesting, but you can use these Kaggle competitions as a way to learn more about real data and as a way to learn more about uh, machine learning models. Um, so with that, we end the session today. I am going to ask a few questions. So for those that want to stay and ask questions, I, I am going to stay for a while. But then for the others, I thank you for participating in the session today.
and hopefully we will see you in subsequent uh, sessions throughout the, the, the semester. The ones that you have on the screen are only the next two, but we are going to have more sessions uh, as the semester progresses. So another question is, is it possible that in a multi-layer model, some parameters become dependent on other parameters? How would you account for that? It's very possible, and indeed that's the case, that there are going to be a lot of inner dependencies between parameters. And in fact, it has been demonstrated that one of the strengths of deep learning models is redundancy. So unlike some models that we typically are familiar with in statistics, in deep learning models, redundancy is a good thing because it gives the model a way to become robust about perturbations in the data. Now, the only reason this redundancy or this collection of correlated parameters is a good idea in deep learning models is because we are preventing overfitting. If we don't have a mechanism to prevent overfitting, this uh, redundancy is going to cause overfitting. Uh, to find the optimal number of iteration, one needs to establish the curve first by performing a large number of iterations. In practice, do we store snapshots of the model parameters at each iteration so that we can select the optimal one? That is a very good point, and that's really what happens in practice. And, and these frameworks for deep learning, they, they will do the snapshotting for you. But really what happens is that the model is going to keep copies of the best models as you go. So you can then go back and select uh, among a collection of models. Um, that is the best uh, given certain uh, criteria. Uh, I want to continue with small data. If data size works for any model, then uh, is not small, even 10 or 20. Well, you, you, it is actually possible to build models with very small data sets. However, you, you need to consider the homogeneity or the heterogeneity of the data. So, and, and you just need to think about it. The only way in which a model that only uses say 10 or 20 data points is going to perform well and generalize is if all your data is very homogeneous, meaning for example, in the case of the digits, all the ones look like very prototypical ones and all zeros look like very prototypical zeros. And why is that important? Because if you only have, let's say, five examples of ones and five examples of zeros, you are essentially assuming that by seeing all those 10 examples, you have seen every digit out there. And for the examples in digits, for example, you can see that that's really not enough. And if you extrapolate that to more complicated examples, let's say we are building a model that takes an image of a cat or a dog and aims to predict, does the image contain an image of a, or a cat? You can see that even if your model performs well with 10 images of a dog and 10 images of a cat, it is almost impossible that in 10 images, you can capture all the variation that are cats, all the different types of cats in different poses, different colors, different species. Uh, so it is nearly impossible. So only if there's certain certainty that 10 examples have good coverage of everything you'll see, 10 or 20 examples are going to be too small, even if the model performs well. Now, uh, one last question, how to make sure testing data is a good representation of general data? That is a very important question. The problem is that sometimes it's very difficult to tell. Um, 
because the basic assumption that we make when we split the data into training, validation, and test is that those three data sets are good representations of the data that we are going to encounter in the real world, right? So the answer to that question falls more in the design of the study than on the models themselves, right? That means that you need to be very careful designing the study to try to get a very good chance that the data that you have in your test set is representative of general data. And in some cases, it's easy to do. In some cases, it is very difficult to do, right? In, in, in medical applications, for example, it's, it's very difficult to do. In images, it's very easy to do for two reasons. One, you can get a very large collection of images very easily. And two, you can get labels for those images also relatively easily. So you have a good coverage and you have better chances that the data that you have in your test set is representative of a general population. So in general, it's very difficult to do. And the best way of tackling that that happens, of the guaranteeing that that, that happens is to design a, a study in a way that is conducted to have data sets that are, or data collections that are reflective of a more general population. So when we build the models on that training set, they can properly generalize as we implement them and start using them in, in practice. Okay, so those are the questions that, that we had for, for today. Uh, for those that stay, uh, thank you for, again, for, for joining the session. And we hope you to see uh, you in, in the next uh, learning experiences. Thanks.